a story worth telling. Some people have stories they would rather not tell. The decisions you make today will determine the stories you tell tomorrow. A successful life is not made up of a few big decisions, but of hundreds and hundreds of small ones. What will your story be? My story, giving the story you want to tell. Well, good morning. It's great to see you on the campus this morning and those joining us online, wherever in the world you might be. Glad that you're with us. Hey, grab your Bible or turn on your digital device. We're in Luke chapter uh, 23 this, this morning, starting a, a brand new series simply called My Story, Living the Story That You Want to Tell, right? Uh, stories kind of make up the fabric of, of, of our lives. Um, right now, right, there's a storyline about this little storm called... Elsa, right? I remember back in the day, uh, there was a storm named Irma. And the story to tell about how in this auditorium, we turned it into a, a medical response center and people from our community who didn't have power came in and, and, and we were able to care for them and, and love them. Right, there's something about stories, right, that, that, that impact us. Uh, many of us, right, we have been waiting patiently for over two years for Top Gun Part Two, right? We keep waiting, it keeps getting pushed back farther and farther and farther. There's something about stories, right? You go out on vacation and something happens and you come back and we went fishing or we went and did this and we had this grand, right? Or, yeah. There's something about stories that connect with all of us. And what I want us to kind of lean in on in these next several weeks is living the story that you want to tell. Living your life, making decisions day by day, day by day in a way that you want to tell this story. We kind of even get it, right, on this day as we, you know, celebrate Independence Day, the 4th of July, there's a story that's being told about America. Uh, sometimes it's a story that has details that we're really proud of. And other times there's part of the story that we wish we could go back and, and, and change because it didn't go exactly how we thought we wanted it to, to, to go. But when you think about stories, it's not just the story that you see on a television set. It's the story that, that you're living and all of us have, have a story to tell. It's like, you know, you, you, you experience something and then you're, you're with your coworker. It's on Monday morning and you say, I, I, I've, got, I've got to tell you, this is what happened this weekend. Now, <laughs> next week when we all show up at work, we'll have one common story. It was a soggy, soggy, soggy weekend, right? But, but there's stories. As, as a pastor, uh, I'm often called upon uh, to officiate funerals. And so this past Friday, uh, we had the celebration of life for Ruth Alford. Uh, Ruth was 96 years young when she graduated to heaven. And the stories of her life. She was a, ready for this, a wedding dress maker. Thousands and thousands of wedding dresses over her lifetime, right? She sat down, she talked to the bride, the groom, kind of looking what it's going to look like, and she began to, to fashion all that together. That wasn't enough. She, she sold that company, and then she became a, a real estate agent, right? The, that, that, the stories of the young couple who was buying their house for the very first time. The story of a, of a single mom who wasn't quite sure that she could afford a house and how Ruth came alongside and helped her find just the right finances. 
There's, there's, there's stories, the story of, 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 of this time when, when I, I had a difficult decision, right? I had a difficult decision, and I kind of thought I wasn't quite sure that I was going to risk and, and, and start this relationship, but 32 years later, this is my wife, right? There's, there's, there's stories that, that, we, that, we, that we tell. Many of you, right, are a part of, and, and in the 1030 gathering, uh, Sarah is going to be, remember for the last several weeks, we've been raising um, thousands and thousands, almost $200,000 that we gave to, to Sarah. And Sarah's going to be able to go out and, and buy, buy a house. She's going to be here in the 1030, right? The story, many of you gave, and the story you're going to be able to tell, listen, man, stepping into Sarah's life, and, and, and she didn't have a place to raise, you know, these foster children. How about this past week at, at, at track, right, with our Royal Family Kids Camp, and track, and these teenage girls and teenage boys, and how you stepped out. Our, our own camp, right? You saw uh, uh, Brad and Alexa wearing the SEU worship, and this weekend, uh, how they're reflecting on the story of how camp was. I'm just saying there's something, there is something about, about stories that we love to tell. But we also have to be honest because some of the stories of our life we'd rather not be told. We sometimes leave certain parts art out of that story. Or we change a few details because we want to be seen in a certain way in that person's eyes and we change. See, the question that I want to put in play this morning is this. Everyone has a story to tell Who's telling your story? Every single one of us has a story to tell. The question is, who's telling your story? Now, you're in your Bible, right? Luke chapter 23. I want to introduce you to, to Joseph. Now, it's not Joseph as in husband of Mary. We're not going there. It's not, it's not the Christmas story. It's not the Old Testament story of, of Joseph, right? And his coat of many colors right? And, and all the adversity that he went through. I want to introduce you to a Joseph that maybe perhaps potentially you're not real aware of. Now, you are definitely aware of the event that's a part of his life. Quite frankly, every single one of us, many of us, those joining us online, annually, once a year, you celebrate the event that was significant in his life. See, Joseph of Arimathea is very much a part of what you would call the Easter story, the resurrection story, the, the story of Jesus Christ who was dead and then became alive again. Joseph of Arimathea is in the very center of this story. Here, check it out. Luke chapter 23. Look what the Bible says. Now, there was a man named Joseph, a member of the council, a good and upright man, who had not consented to their decision and action. He came from the Judean town of Arimathea, and he himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in a linen cloth, and placed it in a tomb, cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. His story... Joseph of Arimathea's story is at the very center of your Easter celebration. This is the one. Now, he didn't, he didn't cause Jesus to arise from the dead. That, that's, that's the God space. But he decided that he was going to let his life, the setting. He is a successful businessman. The mere fact that he had a, had a large tomb that was cut in a rock, that no one, it, it tells us that he's successful. He was a part of the council. He's a Jewish man who's held in, in high esteem. But there's, there's a conflict. Did you catch it? It said that he did not agree. He did not consent with their decision. In other words, they all came together, this council, and they're voting about this Jesus guy. We need to take him out. We need to shut him up. I vote to kill him. I vote we need to go to Pilate right now. We need to tell Pilate, take him out. And the Bible tells us that this dude, Joseph of Arimathea, now think about it. Think about the conflict. Think about the risk when you go against the crowd, when you go against the flow. He's like, 
Now nah, I'm not so sure that I can, I can do that. And then this inciting incident, this moment in the story where he risked everything, right? Jesus, he dies. The council's having a, I mean, the, 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 the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, they're over there, they're having a party. Yo, we took him out. I mean, they're popping out the champagne. They're shaking it up. We crushed that dude. And then there's this guy named Joseph of Arimathea. And he goes to Pilate. And he says, can I have the body? This is a point of no return in the story. All of us, the decisions we make each and every day, there's always this, this point of no return. And this really, for many of us, is the tension. Because most of us think we can make decisions and there'll be no consequences. That's the culture we live today. That we can act in a certain way. We can think in a certain way. We, we, we can go in a, in, in a direction and there'll be no consequences. I, I'm just asking us a story, this, uh, asking us a question this morning. Everyone's got a story. You've got a story to tell. I'm just asking you, who, who's telling who's telling your story living a life one of the one of the greatest benefits there are many benefits of being a pastor but since 1989 sitting in this space where every year a dozen or more people in my life have taken their last breath on this side of eternity and then sitting at kitchen tables all across different points and places of this country and sitting with family members. Many of you, I've sat with your family. And we begin to talk about the story of mom, the story of dad, your brother, your sister. I'm asking a question this morning. Who's telling your story? Everyone has a story. Now, here, here's, here's the temptation in many of your minds right now. Some of us are thinking, well, uh, <laughs> I don't get to tell my story. My parents are telling my story. That, that you know, they, they did this and they did that and my parents split up and so because they split up and because things were said and done to me when I was a young person, I went in this direction. And you've got this idea that somehow that you're a victim and that your story is being told by somebody else who, who made a decision. Maybe it was a teacher. And, and that teacher um, discriminated against you. It was a coach. It was an employer. And they looked down upon you because of your gender, your race, well, whatever it is. And, and they said some things, and that set you off on a course. And you're convinced that your story is being told by a coach, a parent, a teacher, or it's circumstances. Or I'm in this family, and my, my adult mother, she does this, and she does this, and my father never gave me this, and that's why I'm acting like this, and I'm doing like this, or, or the government, or this president, and this president. We, you got this idea that somebody else is telling your story, that, that somehow your actions and your behaviors. You, you might have seen the interview of the young lady uh, who, in the Olympic trials for the 100-meter uh, dash, uh, she is a phenomenal athlete, and she won, and she's headed to Tokyo to represent the United States of America um, to win the gold medal, probably the favorite to win the gold medal. Uh, but then um, she popped positive uh, on, a, on, a, on a test, and she had THC, she had marijuana, and whether or not you think it's okay to drink marijuana or not, or drink, <laughs> <laughs> take your marijuana, however you want to take your marijuana, right? okay, you, you get all that, right? Culture has all kinds of different things. The bottom line is she had violated the different Olympic, Olympic team rules, right? And so I watched her interview, and, and on one hand, she was taking responsibility. She was taking responsibility, but then she began to outline some things that happened, some circumstances, and they can be traumatic. Your, your, your circumstances can be traumatic. What was said, what was done, what happened to you in your life? I, I, I'm not minimizing any of that. But you begin to think that the reason I did this, she's telling a story. Her decision is telling a story of her life your decision is telling a story of your life who's telling your story i'm telling you culture will tell you it's outside circumstances it's what happened in your family it's this grief it's this trauma that forced me that caused me to go in this direction i i i, I want to make it as clear as i can this morning it's it's your decisions that are telling your story 
It's the decision you make day in day in day in day. It's not the big, it's, it's those little decisions that you make along. Today matters. Not one of us can be transported to yesterday and relive and unring yesterday's choices. And not one of us has been promised tomorrow's opportunity for choices. Today's the only day. And you, are, you and I are making choices. We're making decisions every day. And those decisions have consequences. Those decisions are telling the story. My story, living a story that you want to tell. I want to tell a certain story. One day, if I, if I have grandchildren, I got a date first. So first, <laughs> one day if I'm blessed and, and I have, and Coach and Lena, we decided, you know, today you just can't be called grandpa and grandma, right? So my girls aren't even dating. They're not engaged. There's been no weddings and there's no grandchildren yet. But, but Mark and Linda have decided what we want them to call us. Coach and Lena. Isn't that cool? <laughs> coach. Not grandpa, not granddad. I'm going to be coach, Right? Linda was going to be Lena. I just love that name, Lena. She, there, there's a couple in our church, Dom and Lena Ragasta, and we love Lena. And uh, so, Lena, I just, I, 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 right. It's living, I, I, one day when they're giving me signals in the back of the room to move on. <laughs> You've parked here just a little bit too long. Put it in gear, big boy, and let's go to the next exit. Thank you very much, okay? Right, 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 right. So one day, having a grandson or a granddaughter sitting on my knee, I, I want to live a life. I want to have a story that's worth telling. Everyone has, everyone has a story. Who's telling yours? Now, let me see if I can give you, a, give you a, a quick illustration. So right now, many of you know that kind of struggling with, with my shoulder, and so I can't work out, I can't run, I can't do some different things, but I can spin on my bike in my garage. I can do this. And so I set up the Tour de France. Maybe you're not interested, but right now it's the Tour de France. I set it up on the TV, and I got on my bike, and I put it on you know, the, the, the spin machine. But I'm not going to just kind of spin. I got to make up. <laughs> I got to make up for all the weight training I can't do, for all the runs that I can't do. I'm not swimming right now, so I'm going to make up for it. So I'm in my garage yesterday. My garage yesterday. You know how humid it is out there. I, I, I put on my first layer of, of, of long johns. Then I put on my bike shorts, Mike Kaufman. On top of my bike shorts, I put like this this wetsuit material. I call them fat man shorts, but you kind of pull them on, right? Because it just makes you... Then I got a fat man belt. I put this belt around me. Then I put my first sweatshirt on. Then I put on my champion sweatpants. I'm not talking about thin. I'm talking about them big, thick sweatpants. Then I put on my hoodie. And I got on that spin bike. And man, I just started riding. I got in the zone, and I mean, it's, like, you think it's raining outside underneath my spin bike? I mean, it was just trashed. Water down there, no pain, no gain. I'm making a decision. I'm going to be fit, right? I mean, I'm just getting after it. I have my little water bottle there. I'm doing the thing. I'm wiping an eye. I just flat got after it. Felt kind of good. Thank you very much, Right? It was a decision that I made. I could have made all kinds of things. I could have sat on the couch. I could have watched TV. I could have done I got on my spin bike, right? I'm just saying that, that our choices, my decisions, your decisions are telling your story. So I felt quite accomplished. And uh, a little bit later uh, in the day, uh, I, was sitting, I was sitting on my, my couch, and um, um, all of a sudden, my body. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what happened, but the devil himself was in my body. I mean, I was locked up, cramped from my toes. I mean, I, I was like, whoa! I mean, I'm just, and I'm saying to Linda, I mean, I'm like, I'm scared. I mean, it's bad. And I'm saying I had these salt tabs, which they're not going to help in the moment. I said, bring me the pickle jar. I'm drinking pickle juice. 
right? I'm just, I mean, I am locked up. And I'm, she's looking at me like, what am I supposed to do? And I'm going to die. Right, right. And so, hey, I made a decision earlier in that day that I was going to put on my long johns. I was going to put on my bike shorts. I put on my fat man shorts. I put on my fat man belt. I put on my champion sweatpants. I put on my first sweatshirt. I, I, you understand my garage is not air conditioned. I put on my hoodie and I got my sweat on. I made a decision at 10 o'clock a.m., that total story at 1 o'clock p.m. I wish I could tell you that was the end of the story. I mean, I, I was drinking stuff, yeah, right. At the end, and I, and I record everything in my app. Yesterday, 247 ounces of water. 247 ounces of water. That doesn't even include the pickle juice. That doesn't include the coffee. That doesn't include anything else, right? Ask me if I had any sleep last night. Fifty-six-year-old body, fifty-six-year-old bladder. You know what I'm talking about. I'm up all night long. <laughs> I'm telling you that the decisions we think that we can make a decision at ten o'clock a.m. and that they'll have no consequence at one o'clock p.m. or one o'clock a.m. I am telling you the decisions, the decisions that you and I make. They are telling your, my, our story. That's true in Joseph of Arimathea. And what I hope we see over the next several weeks in this story is that the day that your life really begins to turn a page is when you let God become the author of your story. I, I get it, right? You go to college and then you, you get a degree or you don't go to college and go to the military or you go to a trade school and then you're off making money and you're right. And you, you kind of think you're writing your own story. And some of you have been incredibly successful. Congratulations to you. But what I'm here to tell you is that the day your life really turns a page and you really go to a whole nother level in telling your story is when you decide to let God write, write your story. So let God, let God write your story, a story that's worth, worth telling. And as we talked last week, and if you missed it, you go back. Are, are, will you be willing, will you be willing to let God tell your story? Check out Hebrews 12 and 2 on the big Bible on the screen. How do we do this? We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. Notice, the author and the finisher of our faith. The author, our faith of trusting him and following him in this everyday, ordinary life, trusting him. And so how do, how do you do that? And, and what I want to put in play this morning is what we're going to see in the life of Joseph of Arimathea. At some point, you've got to decide who's going to be first in your life. I, now I, know, I know you live in a culture. I know we live in a day where everybody's telling you you can have two first and three first and four first, right? But, but you've, got to, you've got to make a decision. You've got to make a decision. Who will be first? There are no. Do, 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 you remember, do you remember your first kiss? I'm talking about the very, very, very first kiss. Do you remember that? Some of you do? Yeah. Way back in the day? You trying to forget that? <laughs> That's a part of your story you wish you weren't telling, right? Right? I remember the first time I, I kissed Linda. I've told that story. Some of you may have heard it. Uh, we, were, we were both in our middle 20s. Uh, her parents had a house in Seven Hills. And we had gone out to, you know, on our first date and, and really enjoyed ourselves. But I decided, right, I had, I had kind of messed up the whole dating scene before I met Jesus, so now I was going to do it right, right? And so I was waiting, and, and man, she was wanting to kiss me big time on that first date. But I was like, I'm just holding off a little bit. And, um, and uh, it was about three or four dates later. I don't know what it is about you go out to date, you, know, you go out to dinner first on the first date, that goes well. Then whatever it was back in the 80s, this kind of shows you how mixed up the 80s was. <laughs> we, we went to the zoo on our second date, <laughs> Why you go to the zoo on your second date, I don't know. But, but we, we did that back in the day. And I remember coming home, and, and you got the little, you pulled up in this driveway. The garage was detached, and, and uh, there was a little, like, landing, and then there was the, the entrance to the door. And then above, I didn't realize at the time, but above, her younger brother, who was just a teenager at the time, um, his window was there. And I was kind of, you know, I was new in my faith. That's 1988. And uh, I had just met Jesus in, in 87. And so I was being mentored. I was being discipled about praying, about everything, right? You know, pray before you eat, pray before you go to bed at night. And so I just kind of thought, if, 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 if I'm going to get this kiss right, it makes sense to, I mean, it's going to be my first kiss, 
right? Not my second, my third. It's my first kiss with this girl, which I'm convinced she's going to say yes when I ask her to marry me. I mean, I've only known her for a couple weeks, but I'm convinced she's going to say yes, right? So I decide that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, like, pray about it. I think that's important to pray about it, right? So I remember praying, and she was inside, I don't know, or something with her mom or whatever, and I was kind of waiting outside. And when she was going to come back out, I was going to give her a little, you know, maybe a peck on the cheek, you know, say goodnight to her. You know what I'm talking about? It's kind of safe, right? So I, I prayed, and I prayed something like this. Father, Father, up above, shall I kiss the one I love? I think that's a pretty good prayer. Jeff, you know what I'm saying? I mean, it's, 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 it's Jose, you, you meet Mrs. Wright at SAU, right? I mean, just, I'm just saying, it's a great prayer. Father, Father, up above. <laughs> Simmer, you're wishing you prayed that prayer <laughs> before you kissed, right? So, Father, Father, up above, shall I kiss the one I love? What I didn't know is that her younger brother, Rich, who, if you got to kind of know this guy, he's kind of a, you know, jokester guy. He's up there, and he actually heard me pray that. He decided he's going to have some fun. I didn't know it was him. I'm just a young Christian. Father, Father, up above, shall I kiss the one I love? <laughs> and... I hear this audible voice. Sinner, sinner, down below, pucker up and let her go. I'm a young believer, man. I'm just thinking, wow, this God thing's all right, man. So I did, and I've been kissing that girl for 32 years ever since, right? She ain't tired of them kisses. But I remember it. I'm telling you, I, 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 you got to, you got to. So why, why, why? We're going to learn that Joseph pivoted. There was this moment where he made Jesus the center, and he made Jesus the point of his life. Why is that important to us? Because God is best at telling our story. Look at, look at the big Bible on the screen. Psalms 139. Your eyes, the psalmist saying to God, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows your story. How precious to me are your thoughts. God, how vast. Let God, let God be the one. Your life will begin to turn a page. All your dreams, all your hopes, all the things that you're hoping about, all the, t you know, you kind of got the pros on this side and the cons on this side, and you're trying to decide what are we going to do. Hey, listen, try something different. Let God become the author of your story. Jeremiah 29, 11, often taken out of context. God, God, God has got great plans for us, but those great plans are centered in him being the author of our story. Not you going down the road and writing the story and saying, this is what I want, when I want it, how I want it. Now, God, come over here. Yo, God, come on. Get over here. Bless this mess. What the Bible says is, for I know, Jeremiah said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. My story, living the story you want to tell. Everybody in this gathering, online, everyone has, has a story. Your decisions are telling that story. Some of those decisions we're proud of and other decisions there, well, we wish we could change them. There's nothing we can do about that in the past. But starting today, we can start inviting God into the everyday, ordinary parts of our life. It's not the big, grand stories. It's those quiet little moments where God's pressing in on you and you trust me. Joseph of Arimathea, what you're going to see about this guy is it was behind the scenes. Nobody else knew what was going on and he stepped into this space and he made a deliberate story. He made a deliberate decision to let God write a story and think about it. You've never thought about it before. Every year, every song that you sing about the resurrection, every ounce of hope that you have about Jesus becoming alive again. Joseph of Arimathea made a decision to create the space for the celebration that you and I call the resurrection. And that leads right into us gathering together this morning and this time of communion. I, I hope as y'all came in, did everybody get a little communion cup as you came in? If you didn't, just raise your hand up and one of our hosts, they'll, they'll, they'll get one to you, right? This little communion cup. 
there's a story that you're holding here. I would suggest to you it's the greatest story that's ever been told. It's the story of how much God loves you. Unfortunately, too many churches and too many pastors and priests and maybe even with good intentions over the years have told a story that God's mad at you and God's angry with you. Let me tell you something. God's not mad at you. He is madly in love with you. God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ. All of us as human beings have sinned. And there's a cost and there's a penalty for that sin. But you want to know, you want to know where your value is with God? God loved you so much, he did not want you caught in the orphanage of sin. He sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for all of our sins, for your sins, so that we can become adopted into his family. The apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, check out these words and lean into the thought pattern of story. Look what it says in verse 17 on the big Bible on the screen. In the following directives, Paul writes, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. They're telling a story. This church was so jacked up that when they were making decisions, like, it made things worse. When they came together as a church, it, it became even worse. In, in your meetings, they do more harm than good. Look at verse 18. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there's divisions amongst you. And to some extent, I believe it. We understand that. There's divisions right now. We're, we're divided on Sunday mornings by crazy things like denominations, uh, crazy things like the, the color of our skin. I mean, th things really haven't changed, but it's a story. Listen, the decisions that you make today tell tomorrow's stories. This is true in communion that we're about to have. This little cup of juice and this little cracker, it's telling, it's telling a story. Your decisions, my decisions are telling a story. Joseph of Arimathea, he decided that he was going to let God write his story. And think about, think about how the whole world has been changed. Because that man said, listen, let me have his body. Let me take this, this broken, beaten, battered body. They cleaned it. They wrapped it. And they placed it in that tomb. Let your eyes drop down to verse 23. 1 Corinthians 11 and 23. Check this out. He says, I received, for I received, he's telling a story now, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed. He took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. He's telling a story. Jesus made a decision. He left the comforts of heaven. And he came and he took upon the form of a man. The story of Jesus isn't something we do on Sundays before the buffet line. It's not some fire insurance that we have just in case that like maybe grandpa's story about heaven and hell is really true. This is, the, this is the story that God loves us. And Jesus makes a decision and he comes and he takes a piece of bread and he breaks it and he says, I want you to know, guys, my body is going to be broken for you. Then he says in verse 25, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, look at you proclaim, you tell the story of the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord is an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood. In other words, pause. Look what it says in verse 28. Pause. Everyone ought to examine themselves. Hey, stop examining everybody else on Facebook and just examine you. What's going on with me? Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For those who eat and drink it without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment on themselves. So there's a story. What's your story? My story when it comes to Jesus is... Until 1987, I just didn't want Jesus mad at me as a high school kid. 
Because if he was mad at me, then he would cause me to fumble the ball on Friday nights and I wanted to score touchdowns. I thought, I thought Jesus was this religious entity that you better not make that old boy mad. It won't be good for you. Until in Okinawa, Japan, Navigator missionaries pointed out for me what it means to follow Jesus. It changed, changed my life. What's, what's your story? Have you begun following Jesus? Do you know Jesus? I'm not asking you to be a church member. Or I'm, I'm not asking you to modify your behavior and stop. I'm, I'm asking you, how are things with you? And do you know Jesus personally? Scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Have you received that gift? If you've never received the gift, today's a great day. Online, in this space. You can have a conversation with God in your mind right now. Hey, God, it's me. I've been telling the story that had me as the hero, had me as the savior. That's not working too well. So this morning, Jesus, I recognize that I can't save me. My sin separated me from you. I believe that you died on that cross for me. And three days later, you became alive again. And I invite you to be my savior. And to people who are praying that, man, welcome to God's family. That conversation in my mind at a United States military base, Camp Foster in Okinawa, Japan, that little decision on that day changed the entire trajectory of the story of my life. If you just prayed with me online or in this space, I'd love to help you continue to grow. You can text the word today to 63566 and We'll reach back out to you, or you can use the card right there at your chair. And just let us know that today you made a decision to follow Jesus. We'll come alongside of you. I want to help you to continue to grow. It's not a one and done. It's, it's the beginning. It's the story of your life, making Jesus the author and the finisher of your faith. But in Corinthians, this story is unpacked. And you'll notice this little cup that we gave you as you came in. If you pull back that first tab it'll let loose this little, this little wafer. And the story that Jesus talked about was that his body would be broken, and it was, it was broken. He, he loves us. He loves you. And so just in the quietness of this space, would you just pause as a Christ follower in, in your own mind, in your own heart, let him know that you're thankful. The salvation that he's given you. Just in your own words, let, let, let him know. Joining us at home, wherever you might be, a little piece of bread or cracker where you have, here in this space, Jesus, that night that he was betrayed, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. The story continued after supper, and you'll notice on this little cup, there's a second tab. You can pull that back in this little grape juice. He wanted them to know that Everything was about to change. See, up until that point, the only person who had access, the story of all humanity was the only person who had access to God was the high priest. No one had access. But Jesus is turning the page. He's telling a different story. He said there's a new covenant. Now every human being who has faith in Jesus Christ has 100% access. You don't have to come through me. My name's just Mark. I'm on the same dusty trail called life that you are. Because of Jesus, you have instant access. That's what it meant by this, this covenant. Talk to a medical doctor, they'll tell you that the life of the flesh is in the blood. When the blood gets sick, the body is sick. 
Jesus poured out his blood because sin had made all of us sick. But he didn't want us to stay there. He wanted us to know that we were created in his image and that there is a great purpose for your life and we can walk in freedom and we can make a difference in everyday life. So as you hold this little cup, I just want you to, if you're willing, would you just pray and ask God over these next several weeks to help you understand his story for your life? Would you do that? Hey, God, it's, it's Mark. Over these next several weeks, just open up my eyes, my mind, and my heart to your story for my life. You, you, you created me. You know me. You designed me. Open me up. That night, he said, this, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink this in remembrance of me. What an incredible way to start this Independence July 4th. This, this idea that Joseph of Arimathea sets an example for us that we'll see over the next several weeks. How he made a decision. Life really turns its page when you let God write your story. For some of you, one of your best next steps would be getting into a small group or starting a small group. See, in this space, you get to know the story of other people and people get to know your story. And so I would really encourage, if you want to start a group or get involved in a group, you can text the word groups to 63566. I'm in a group, meets on Tuesday nights at 6.30. Being in that, in that, in that space, it's, it's a help. I, I, I get to know people, and people get to know me. Telling a story. Some of you, maybe you want to tell a different story with your time and invest your time in students or on our campus. Um, maybe God's gifted you with singing. or I don't know, I don't know what it is. But love, you want to you start some ministry to reach out to our community. Um, text the word team to 63566. Maybe you want to you start a ministry on and, and how not to abuse your body on a spin bike. Don't cramp up. Five, five EBs, five, can't even say it. <laughs> I don't, I don't know, it may, it's, maybe it's a ministry that's happening right now. Maybe it's a brand new ministry to our community. Um, but let's, let's tell a story. You, you, the decisions that you're going to make, God gave you that idea. Let's step out into that white space. Let's go tell a different kind of, of, of story. As Emily said, thank you for many of you who give generously. Maybe a part of your story is, I, I want to give. I want to lean in. and I want to I wanna give. I want, I want the story of Jesus to be told in Ocala, Marion County, the state of Florida, around, around, around the world. I don't know. Maybe you want to be baptized and follow that example. I, I just know this, is we all have a story to tell. Everyone has a story. And it's your decisions that are telling your story. God, I love you. Man, I have loved gathering with these incredible men and women this morning. Your church is meeting all across the city. Your church is meeting across this county and state. Declaring your greatness. The song that we sing, you are great. And I just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come over all of us and help us over these next several weeks to really hone in. Maybe some of us need to start something. Maybe some of us in this room need to stop. There's something in our life that we need to stop. Maybe we need to step out and go. Be who you've created us to be. Maybe instead of leaving a relationship, we need to stay. I, I, I don't know how you'll guide us, God, but I'm fully confident that you will. Just as you moved on Joseph of Arimathea, may we learn about this guy. And Holy Spirit, may those truths, the stories of our lives, may we live in such a way that there's a story worth telling. May your hand of favor be on all here today. I sure do love you.
It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Peace.